Golfers will say you have never truly played golf until you've played on the old course at St. Andrews. And mountain climbers will say you've never really climbed a mountain unless you've scaled Mount Everest. Skiers will say you've never really skied until you've skied the Alps. And chapel speakers at Southern Seminary will say you've never really been introduced <laughs> until you've been introduced by Dr. Don Whitney. You students want to know how to write a quality research paper, do the kind of meticulous research that Dr. Whitney does to prepare to introduce chapel speakers, but leave out all of the creative lies in your actual paper. I am so grateful for many members of my church here, West Broadway Baptist Church, joining me, but you do realize that uh, you have uh, told on yourselves today, you have shown me that it is possible for you to sit at the front of the church. <laughs> so I'll be expecting uh, a different look this coming Sunday. Well, in 1874, author Henry Drummond wrote a best-selling book entitled, The Greatest Thing in the World. Now, if we were to ask someone that question today, what, what do you think is the greatest thing in the world? How do you think they would answer? How would you answer? Drummond said that the greatest thing in the world is the agape love described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So please turn there in your Bible. Agape is active goodwill towards others. It's seeking their best interests. It's the love of the will, not of the emotions. It's the love that expresses itself in sacrifice and self-denial kind of love that desires the greatest good of the other person. It's God's self-giving, sacrificial love. Leon Morris notes that the word agape wasn't a word in, wise, in wide use before the founding of the Christian church, but that the Christian church made it its characteristic word for love. February is often called the love month because Valentine's Day is February 14th. Husbands, if you miss that, two dozen roses today would be an appropriate penance. But for the past month, we have been bombarded with advertisements about Valentine's Day, about love. But what is the kind of love that is being advertised and promoted? Today, most people view love as an emotion an emotion that you can fall into or fall out of. When a couple splits up, they often say, well, we just fell out of love. Agape love is not something you fall into. It is not something you can fall out of. Agape love is not an emotion. It's an act of the will. We agape those, we love those whom we choose to love. Our culture views love as something you have for someone who is lovable, someone who is worthy of being loved. Agape love, on the other hand, has nothing to do with the recipient's worthiness. Leon Morris says, agape is love lavished on others without a thought whether they are worthy or not. It is unconditional. Well, with that understanding of the word love here in 1 Corinthians 13, let's look at why agape love is the greatest thing in the world. This chapter easily divides into three sections. At the end, verses 8 through 13 speak of the permanence of love. It never ends. And at the beginning, verses 1 through 3 speak of the preeminence of love, why it truly is the greatest thing in the world. C could I summarize verses 1 through 3 in a Southern Seminary version? You can be so eloquent that you not only win the Francisco Preaching Award, the seminary decides to rename the award after you. And you can be so brilliant in theological mysteries that your tweet on the Trinity gets a thousand retweets and 10,000 likes. And you can be so giving that you forego your daily Starbucks, Java chip, Frappuccino so you can take that money and help a fellow student buy textbooks. You can do all of that, but the scripture says without love, it is nothing. 
It is zero, zero, null, nada. Apart from love, all our, all our uh, giftedness, all our service, all our sacrifice amounts to nothing. Well, if that is how important love is, it, if it truly is the greatest thing in the world, then we need to know what it looks like. How will we know if we are loving others with this agape love? This morning, I want to focus on the middle verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, where we see the practice of love. These verses describe how true love truly loves. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, and I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. How are we to describe true love, agape love? In these verses, love is not defined so much as it is described. Love can be defined only by describing what it does and what it does not do. In the context here, Paul is rebuking the self-centeredness of the church in Corinth. And through them today, rebuking much of our own self-centeredness in our church life and in our family life today. In the love of God, there's no place for demanding our rights, for envying others, for putting, puffing ourselves up, or for treating people unkindly or with sinful anger. In the original Greek, these characteristics are not adjectives, but verbs. That, that's very telling. It's saying that a loving person will act in certain ways. These verses truly do describe love in action. Agape love doesn't simply have feelings of patience, it demonstrates patience toward others. Agape love doesn't simply have kind emotions, it displays kindness in its interaction with others. Love is not some kind of abstract virtue. It's displayed in the daily fabric of our lives as we relate to others. Paul shows us what agape love produces. Paul doesn't say agape love is, is warm, fuzzy feelings. No, true love sacrifices. So let's look at 14 characteristics of love in action. None of you have lunch plans today, do you? Okay. The first characteristic is that love suffers long. Love suffers long. See, if we're to display agape love in this world, it will be love towards sinners, towards sinful people. The, the Bible is very realistic. If we're to love in this broken, fallen world, we're going to have to love broken, fallen people. And so Paul begins this list by saying that love is patient. We think patience is waiting two minutes for the microwave to heat something up. The King James translates this word long suffering. Love suffers long. I don't have to tell any of you that people can be frustrating and irritating. Some people are seemingly born with rough edges on their personality. But if love can't be patient in the midst of those realities, then it really becomes just another form of selfishness. In other words, if, if I'm willing to love someone only so long as they please me, as they meet my expectations, but, but when they frustrate me, I stop loving them, then that's not really love, that's selfishness. When love is wronged, it is patient. Though love suffers energy, injury, it does not strike back. But we often seek to blame our lack of patience on others, don't we? Well, that, that, that person, he, he's just so frustrating. She, she's just a real problem person. R raise your hand if you can think of somebody with rough edges that is hard to love. Okay, there's a few honest people here. 
And, and while we're raising our hands here, somewhere else, someone is raising their hand thinking of us. <laughs> Love gives us the power to be patient, to suffer long. You all are familiar with the patience prayer, right? Lord, I want patience and I want it right now. <laughs> Love is patient, but we are often so impatient. Second, love acts kindly. You see, to be patient, to suffer long, could just be a display of stubbornness. Or it could be a manifestation of apathy. I, I just don't care. But to be kind to the person who has done wrong is a triumph of grace. Love is kind, but we are so often unkind. Love not only absorbs the injury, but shows positive kindness to the person who caused it. Love is kind to those who offer nothing in return, even to those who offer heartache in return. Third, love does not envy. Love does not envy, but we so often envy those who have what we don't have. A proper perspective on God's providence, on God's sovereignty will help us to overcome envy. And also a spirit of gratitude will help us to overcome envy. Focusing on what God has blessed us with, counting our blessings, naming them one by one, and instead of focusing on what we don't have. Where there's no agape love, there will always be envy. Fourth, love does not boast. You see, envy is what we feel towards those who we think have more than we do. Boastfulness is what we project on people where we feel like we have something they don't have. And boy, was that on full display in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there were those in the church who were envying those who had certain gifts, and there were others who were boasting that they had gifts that others did not. Moffat's translation of this phrase is brilliant. Love makes no parade. Love does not boast, but we seem to boast every chance we get. Fifth, love is not arrogant. Arrogance or conceit is the root of boasting. And that was part of the problem in Corinth. The people in Corinth were spiritual show-offs. And that's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And that's a danger that we can face on this campus, the, the danger in studying theology is that we can begin to look down on those who haven't had the privilege that we have had here, who don't know as much as we know about the Bible and about theology, and we can become arrogant. Love is modest. Love is humble. Six, love does not behave rudely. How can Christians behave rudely? Well, people who are so proud of their honesty I just tell it like it is. But they have no compassion for people. They bludgeon people. They use the truth like a club. Person who has agape love is not rude. Seventh, love is not self-seeking. Love is forgetful of self and thoughtful towards others. Agape love is always unselfish. Now, that is so easy to say, but so hard to do, so hard to practice, especially because selfishness is at the very heart of our sin. Love is never selfish, but we are so self-centered. Our sin causes us to want everything to be all about us. We want to be at the center of the universe. We, we want everything to revolve around us, everyone to cater to us. But love reminds us it is so not about us. It's about God first. It's about others second. We come third in that equation. Love finds its joy in serving others. Love does not seek its own. Eighth, love is not irritable. It's not quick-tempered. Love is slow to anger. Love has a long fuse. J.B. Phillips translates this, love is not touchy. You know, there is such a thing as righteous anger. Jesus cast the money changers out of the temple. 
And we should be angry at things like injustice. But too often our anger is due to selfish reasons. We feel slighted, we feel ignored, our feelings get hurt. Love is not thin skin. Love is not easily offended. But people who don't have this love are touchy. They respond to any perceived or real slight. We have the expression of some individuals, you know, you, you just have to handle that person with kid gloves. When you're around that person, you have to walk on eggshells. Always touchy, always irritable, always easily offended. You know, when I get irritable, do you know why? Well, the same reason that you get irritable because we really do want the world to revolve around us. We want other people to serve us, to meet our needs, even if we haven't expressed them. And when they don't, we get irritable. But real love isn't that way. Real love isn't irritable. Ninth, love keeps no record of wrongs keeps no record or does not take into account. It's a bookkeeping term signifying making a ledger entry. You see, love doesn't do that. Love doesn't write down wrongs for future reference. Warren Wearsby tells of a man who actually kept a notebook, a written record of people who had offended him so that he could go back and review it regularly. And, and we hear that and, and we bristle and say, who, who would do such a thing? Not, not me. No, we would never be so brash as to actually keep a written notebook. We, we just imprint those memories on the hard drive of our mind. We keep them and catalog them there so that we can access them at a moment's notice. We keep score. And that's sadly often true in marriage. Paul Tripp has noted that some people hold on to the record of their spouse's wrongs as if it were a valuable family heirloom. Heard the story of one man talking to another man and he said, you know, every time my wife and I get into an argument, she gets historical. The man said, don't, don't you mean hysterical? He, he said, well, that too, but, but she gets historical. She brings up every wrong thing I've ever done. Now, I need to note that is not autobiographical. <laughs> I have a wife who exemplifies 1 Corinthians 13 more than any person I have ever known. Love keeps no record of wrongs. But I think we can all identify with the man who says, I, I know that you're supposed to forgive and forget, but I have such a bad memory, I keep forgetting I forgot. But contrast that to Clara Barton, Christian nurse, founder of the American Red Cross. She was once asked if she remembered a, a terrible wrong done against her. And I love her reply. She said, I distinctly remember forgetting that. That is Christian love in action. Tenth, love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Let me read C.K. Barrett's description of this verse. He writes, love does not seek to make itself distinctive by tracking down and pointing out what is wrong. It gladly sinks its own identity to rejoice with others at what is right. Love doesn't take secret delight in the failings of others. But what a heart check for us. Are we heartbroken at the misfortune of others or in our innermost beings, do we take secret delight that, that that person got what was coming to them? Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Eleventh, love bears all things. It bears patiently. Love is durable. Its capacity for suffering is great. Twelfth, love believes all things. Now, this doesn't mean that love is naive, that it's easily deceived, that love is blind. It means that love is not at its root basically suspicious. 
It takes the most positive view of every circumstance for as long as it can. Love gives the benefit of the doubt. It's always trusting. It doesn't look for the worst in people, but for the best in people. Thirteenth, love hopes all things. It hopes for the best with regard to everyone. It's basically optimistic instead of pessimistic. When love is disappointed in one in whom it is trusted, it continues to hope for the best. And we need to note the basis for such hope is not human optimism, but of the power of God to bring real and radical change in people's lives. Love that believes that God's grace can conquer even this situation. Fourteenth, love endures all things. The Greek word here is a military term and means to persevere under continual onslaught from the enemy. In spite of all the attacks made against it, though they be legion, love perseveres. It cannot be conquered. So let's summarize what these verses teach us. Notice that Paul doesn't describe love in terms of its greatest works, sacrifices, martyrdoms, or triumphs. He describes agape love and how it's displayed in the day in, day out, hustle and bustle of life in a real world with real people. And this was a rebuke to the Corinthians because their lack of love was contributing to all of their problems. So what about us today? Could we not conclude that most of our problems are caused by our lack of agape love? Wouldn't this type of love solve most, if not all, of our problems? Now, if anyone in this world should be loving, it should be those of us here. In fact, Francis Schaeffer pointedly said that agape love is the mark of the Christian. If you, if you truly want to know if someone is a genuine believer, they will bear on them the mark of love. So let me give you an assignment, uh, a heart check. Walk through these verses and insert your name wherever you find the word love. This will rattle your cage. Tim Booker is patient. He suffers long, sometimes. Tim Booker acts kindly, oh, okay. Tim Booker is not self-seeking. He does not insist on his own way. Oh my. Tim Booker is not irritable. Next. Tim Booker keeps no record of wrongs. My own family, most of whom are here today, could readily testify of my multitude of failings in living out the truths here of 1 Corinthians 13. And as we do that exercise, as we insert our name in 1 Corinthians 13 where the word love appears, we could easily be driven to despair. I can't love like this. Who can love like this? Well, the answer is obvious. I can't love this way. You can't love this way. This type of love is not natural. It is supernatural. And these verses reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you can insert the name Jesus Christ in place of the word love in this passage, and it's a beautiful picture of who Christ is. Jesus Christ is patient. Jesus Christ is kind. Jesus Christ is not arrogant. So if you would learn to love like this, you first must experience his love in your life. You first must acknowledge your sinfulness and how you have turned away from God and repent of that, change your mind of that, and come to Christ, the one and only Savior, who displayed true agape love by dying on a cross for sinners. You will never be able to live with this kind of love until you have that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not trying to produce these qualities in your life by human effort. It's by submission to the Holy Spirit 
who fills our hearts with the love of God day by day. Though this type of love is not natural, it is supernatural. We would not expect this kind of love from an unbeliever, would we? We'd not be surprised if an unbeliever did not display this kind of love, but we ought to be surprised when Christians don't. Because agape love is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we will display this kind of love. Some of you may have heard the phrase as as to how you can know if you've truly been filled by the Spirit. It's an old phrase that goes like this. If if you want to know if you're truly filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not how high you jump, but how straight you walk once you land. As Paul unfolds the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, you know the first item he mentions? The fruit of the Spirit is agape. Agape love. We display this love as we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit, as we allow him to fill us with this type of love. And through that, we're able to display it to others. If our life is not displaying agape love, that means one thing, we're filled with the flesh, we're filled with ourself. Let's ask God to help us agape one another through the fullness of the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you told us the world would know that we are your disciples if we agape one another. Yet how often we fail. It's hard for us to admit that we are unloving people, but so often we are. Thank you for displaying to us what true agape love looks like. Help us to abide in you, to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit so our lives will be a picture of agape love to others. We ask these things so that your name might be magnified and glorified. Amen.